The Move, Look, and Listen podcast with Dr. Doug Steffi is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download by visiting audibletrial.com forward slash inbound. We'll have a link in the episode notes for your convenience. Many of the books mentioned here in the podcast are available in Audible. Sign up for a free 30-day membership trial, and you can download any book you like. Support the Move, Look, and Listen podcast with Dr. Doug Steffi by visiting audibletrial.com forward slash inbound. If our two eyes are not working together well as a fast, synchronized team, our internal map quest continues to be off. It's consistently inconsistent with our ability to judge time and space. Those that don't feel well grounded, those that have some measure of anxiety, oftentimes it starts in the visual system. If you can't move, look, and listen in a fast, accurate, effortless, sustainable, age-appropriate, meaningful way, you're in a world of hurt. There's a whole world in vision and how it affects brain function that no one's ever shared with you. 2020 is perceived as the holy grail of going to the eye doctor. Well, I'm here to change that paradigm. Hello, and welcome to the Move, Look, and Listen podcast. I'm Dr. Doug Steffi, your host. Our guest today is Leslie Fisher. She is a sought-after educational technology speaker. Leslie, welcome to the show today. Well, thank you for having me. Well, I'm grateful that you're willing to come along and play, uh, not the least of which is because of your ed tech background, but also because of your own experiences. And with that in mind, um, we may ultimately change the title of this episode, but let's go with If Books Could Kill. <laughs> and, the, and the reason and the relevance of that is because there are untold numbers of children in school today who struggle with learning and reading. And we're going to elaborate on that a little bit today. And that title, though, is kind of a slow death for a lot of these kids because too much of our sense of self and our self-worth is tied up in how we perceive ourselves in others' eyes. And if you struggle with learning, in most cases reading, your ego gets really bruised, and it has the potential to have lasting lifetime scars. And it's the unique individual that can break through that and still have a successful, happy life. And that's possible. And part of the purpose of this podcast is to get earlier diagnoses made so more appropriate interventions can occur. And maybe we can head off a lot of that lack of self-worth for the kids that are otherwise not going to make it through. So I'm curious for you to share with the audience your own evolution in getting to see me, because you know a couple of individuals who I believe had been telling you to come and see me for yes. a period of time before you yes. ever did. Absolutely. First of all, I'm thankful for you because you've definitely made my world a, a better, brighter place. And, and so let me explain why. So I consider myself a pretty witty, smart kind of kid. I came from brilliant parents. I had a brilliant brother. Uh, but for some reason, I just couldn't make it happen in school. And I couldn't figure out why. I was the one in the class that when the teacher asked, is everyone done reading? All the hands would go up. And my I wasn't done reading, but there was no way in heck that I was going to admit that I, I was the only one not done reading. So I basically would sheepishly raise my hand and lie and say that I was done reading. Uh, I would look at a page of text and I would just get so disconnected. Uh, words didn't make sense. I, if, if it looked like a pile of text, I just couldn't do it. And I was very disengaged in the class and I was very demotivated and I never did well in school. The only place I really did well in school was music. For some crazy reason, I could read sheet music and I don't know why. And even from a super young age, I could, I could read sheet music faster than most any other kid. And, and I took to it and it was, was just very easy for me to do. So school at all times was a struggle. Um, a major struggle, but I knew I had to go through school. You have to go through school. You have to graduate. And I, I did everything I could. Uh, I figured out any way around anything to try to figure out how I could ingest the content that I needed to ingest to uh, graduate, to get past that class, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I, I continued to struggle. And when I was a music major at USC, that was when I kind of got introduced to technology. I'm older, so I never really had technology through my 
you know, any part of my K-12. But in college, that was when I was introduced to, at that time, the Macintosh computer. And it, it allowed me to, to do basic things like change font sizes and change fonts and do other things that made it a little bit easier for me to read. And I really enjoyed technology to the point that I wanted to discover it more and I wanted to dig in more. So I dropped out of the music school and I was actually uh, I, uh, Apple student rep for Apple for the last two years at USC. And I became a uh, systems engineer, which is a geeky way of saying I was the geek in a sales cycle at Apple. And really the big moment for me in terms of realizing just what kind of a learning problem I had was when mobile technology came out. Because when the iPhone came out, and then all of a sudden there were three different apps that could do the same thing, but do it in three different ways. I began to basically be able to customize my learning. So that's when I realized, hold on. And in my world, technology very much plays an important role to keep me educated because I'm able to use specific apps, specific web browsers, specific technology, specific techniques uh, to be able to bring in the content that I need to bring in. And I slowly made a change from, I, I left Apple in 97. I, I was teaching a lot about web development, about web 2.0. And then when mobile technology came out, I kind of put the pieces together and said, hold on, there's got to be other versions of me in the classroom. And I want to be able to present to educators and show them all of the different tools out there. Because because technology and mobile technology gives us so many options now that the versions of me that were struggling in a class might not struggle as much. And so that's been kind of my passion. Now, um, I've been at this 22 years and, and for uh, 12 years, I've really put a, a, a focus on trying to introduce educators to as many tools as I can, knowing that we're all individual learners. And I'm so thankful that in today's classrooms, uh, we all don't get a blue book and a number two pencil anymore. Uh, there might be five different pieces of technology happening in that classroom because it's to help to all those different learners in those classrooms. So then how did, how do you come into play here? Um, is my chiropractor, kinesiologist, Dr. Marla Omar, someone that you know. Uh, she told me ages ago this, that I should see you. And I thought, I like my optometrist. Why should I cheat on my optometrist? I'm a a customer for life kind of kid. And, and then I introduced Dr. Omar to Ralph Jackson, who's been my massage therapist for 15 years. And then she introduces Ralph Jackson to you. And then Ralph Jackson drinks the Dr. Steffi punch. And so every massage I get is, have you seen Dr. Steffi? And then he'd like work it into things like, well, do you know what would be really good is if you saw Dr. Steffi, so really, just to get Ralph to pardon, just to shut up, I, I, I decided when I had five weeks open that I would go see Dr. Steffi. And little did I know the difference that you would make to my world, Dr. Steffi. Well, you know, and I think the thing that's so fascinating about your story is how you managed to find your way to access learning in a way that you couldn't easily do before in a conventional textbook kind of format. And, and certainly over your lifetime, you've had any number of eye exams. And Nearly. in other episodes, I talk about a two-circle Venn diagram, which is where most optometrists practice and most ophthalmologists practice, right? One circle, can you see 2020? The other circle is, are your eyes healthy? And those are important circles, but they weren't meeting your needs, right? There's a third Correct. circle in the Venn diagram. And this episode is in part designed to share your story so that others who are finding themselves in the same situation will realize early on that there's a third circle in this discussion. And if your eye care has been limited to the two circle Venn diagram, you'll realize that it's not sufficient. Yeah, and, and not to, I'm sorry, not to interrupt you, but another part of it for me is I've been sharing this situation with my audiences and people want to learn more about it. They're like, well, what is this? And I have limited time with this. So I appreciate, appreciate this opportunity because it's not just for maybe a person listening to a podcast, but it could be for a teacher that might be able to identify students in their class uh, that might be suffering from this as well. That's a good point, Leslie. And certainly, Parents and teachers are the first line in being able to read the tea leaves of that kid's behavior. And so we need to give them that mechanism by which to do it. And we'll end up at the end of the show notes, we'll put a couple links uh, to some behavioral surveys and questionnaires about 
how to predict of whether or not your child has a learning-related vision problem. And we'll also provide some resources about how to go find more information on these specific topics. Awesome. Because I don't want you or your child to suffer needlessly. With having said that, um, you did come and see me um, all of about a couple of months ago, I suppose. April, early April. It's been that long already? Oh yes, my sir. I can hear. I'm going to click on calendar dates. I remember the date well because you. the next day you gave me one of the worst migraines I had in my life. Um, I saw but that was, a bl- that was a blessing though, right? It was, was a, a blessing was, of a migraine. It was the worst and the best migraine I ever had in my life. Um, it was April, April 2nd. Did you say April 2nd? Well, and to be abundantly clear, when you came to see me and we did testing in that third circle, and, and some of the things that make up the third circle, eye teaming, eye focusing, eye tracking, visual attention, magnocellular vision, working memory, primitive reflexes, something called a millisecond timing clock, something called visual aliasing. Visual aliasing is mostly reflective of an undiagnosed binocular vision problem. And the interesting thing about visual aliasing is that there's a pattern of black and white stripes that I have somebody look at. And if it's particularly bothersome to your eyes, you don't want to look at it. And the lines tend to move and wiggle and vibrate, and you might see colors in the black and white stripe lines. And it usually is not particularly comfortable. In fact, there's a warning at the bottom of this pattern that stripes is that do not look at this if you have a history of migraine or epilepsy. And I've never knowingly triggered a migraine, certainly in the office, by having somebody look at those stripes. But what did, I think, happen is that for a lifetime of not knowing that there were skills in the third circle, I drew those skills out of you and I asked your brain to perform visual tasks that no one had done before. Yeah, no, you hurt my brain. You found out we hurt. And then also it was the, uh, I think it was when we started doing the color therapy stuff too. That just wigged my brain out big time. And to me, that was like the big aha when we were going through all the different color color options for me that I ended up with this gargantuan migraine. And when I did, I'm like, this man's onto something. <laughs> well, you make a good point because obviously the things that I do and other optometrists that practice like like I do, we want your quality of life to be better and we want improvements in things, but I'll take an aversive response over no response. Absolutely. I'm with you too. That's like what I said. I sat there like, okay, he's on to something. Although, although having said that, in most cases, yes, we're looking for a positive benefit to your quality of life. But if we do something that makes it worse, again, we know we're on to something. But I have some patients who don't have an aversive response to some of the things that I do in the office when I know that they should. And when those things are true, when those outcomes are true, and I'm expecting uh, a bad response to, let's say, that pattern of black and white stripes, and I don't get such a response, invariably, it tells me that their brain is shutting off one eye in order to prevent the two eyes working together poorly, or that it looks like they're paying attention to this pattern of black and white stripes when in fact they're not paying attention to it. They're looking through the stripes and not at the stripes. And that's pretty common when we see how these vision issues relate to reading. Because if, if you generally find looking at print aversive, if you get sleepy, tired, bored, lose attention, can't focus on the print, lose your place, skip over words or lines, or can't remember what you read, reading's not a very rewarding experience. And so you tend not to do it. And of course, If you're a beginning reader and you can't visually engage in text in all of the letters in the words and how the individual letters and the letter combinations that make up our alphabetic writing system are actually pictures of sound written down in a symbolic language format, you never figure out those common spelling patterns and really become a fluent decoder. 
you tend to look at the shape of words and not all the internal details. And the classic example that I give would be the word horse and the word house. And that the only difference between those words are the third letter in the sequence, right? It's H-O-U versus H-O-R. And if I took a pencil and drew a box around each of those words and then took the letters away and just looked at the shape of the box, those words look identical. And so if you tend to look at the beginning of endings of words and don't have the visual skills to look at the internal components of the letters that make up the inside of the word, you tend to guess at words in context, or you get the first sound or two in a word right, and then just make up the rest of the word. Or if you're silently reading, and I don't really know where you're up to, you just skip over those words that you can't decode. And if you've got really strong language skills and a really really creative mind, you may make up a better story than one that the author has written But when it comes to testing and comprehension, you're not going to know the story that you were supposed to have read. And in the context of that, to survive reading, you either slowly and laboriously read almost letter by letter, or you're a skim and scanner where you think, you know what, I've got to get through this reading. I'm supposed to understand something of what I'm reading good Lord, I can't pay attention to all the letters on the page. It's overwhelming. So you get an idea that you're supposed to get some content. And if you've pre-read or have an opportunity to pre-read the questions of what you're going to get tested over, or like the end of the chapter questions, you can go back through the chapter and just skim and scan and pick out the highlights. Or maybe you read the bolded headlines Or look at the pictures and the captions that are beneath those pictures, but you're not reading all the words on the page. And those are strategies that really bright, strong language-based people use to survive. I had one patient of mine who's in his early to mid-50s who's got a master's degree in counseling. And when I was telling him the story and he conveyed to me how he got through graduate school... He said, Doug, I couldn't read and comprehend at the same time. So before there were books on tape, he would read his assignments to himself, tape himself, and then go back and listen to the tape because he could not lift language comprehension off the page through his visual system. And another strategy that I will guarantee that some of you listeners do if you fall in this third circle category is you'll move your lips when you read or you'll read out loud to yourself. And the reason that you're doing those things is because you know you're struggling to lift language comprehension off the page through vision, and you're making reading become a motor and an auditory learning outcome because you struggle through the vision piece. So Leslie, you've been doing one of the two vision therapy programs that I'm ultimately going to have you do. If we circle back to that third circle Venn diagram and all the relevant factors that are in there, and and what do we learn when you come and have a Dr. Doug kind of eye exam? Well, I'm going to presume that you have a problem with the way your eyes work together until you prove to me by the history taking or the tests that I conduct that you, in fact, don't have a binocular vision problem. So if you see a doctor in the two-circle diagram, they're never even going to think about your binocular vision skills, whereas my mindset is, you have this problem until you prove to me that you don't. So when I talked about visual aliasing and this black and white striped grid and the reaction that you had to it where your eyes and head tend to hurt, especially when both eyes are open looking at the grid, that leads me to understand that your two eyes want to go out of synchrony with each other. So if if we think about the two eyes as being two global positioning satellites that have to be in perfectly synchronous orbit, and if they tend to go out of synchrony with each other, uh, and in your case, your eyes want to drift slightly outward from each other, more up close than they do at far. 
And there's a fancy term for that called convergence insufficiency, right? Convergence means come together. Insufficient means not enough. So your brain, imagine that I glue a bungee cord to the outside of each eye and that we stretch the bungee cords outward from each other. Your eyes want to pull outward. And if you're going to look at a page of print, for example, your brain's going to have to effortfully stretch those bungee cords back to center so that both eyes can look together at the same letters on the page. And if you take an ounce of attention off of that effort, things are going to get blurry or double, or you're going to get a headache or migraine or motion sick, or feel it in your ears, your jaw, your throat, your chest, or your gut. So your brain can work really hard to try to keep the bungee cords together so that your two eyes are working as a team, or your brain could shut one eye off and the other eye now is unencumbered with its mate, or you can simply not pay attention and figure out other ways to occupy your time by not looking at print. Or you can read really slow or skim and scan like we talked about before. So when I find somebody that has two eyes that work together poorly, there's a couple of primary ways to try to improve immediately on your quality of life. The most immediate outcomes that I found are prescribing either color in lenses or prisms in lenses or something called low plus lenses or any combination of those three. And my goal, at least in the black and white striped grid is, can I immediately improve your quality of life by being able to look at that grid and not have an aversive response to it by any combination of these lenses? And if I can do that, you're going to want to go home with the glasses prescription that I put together as a trial pair of lenses because it feels so much better. Well, not only is it easier to look at print, but in many circumstances, it reduces somebody's tactile defensiveness, It meaning that for those patients that have been diagnosed with a sensory processing disorder, all of their sensory systems tend to be on high alert status. So their touch sensitivity goes up, they're bothered by movement in their periphery, bright colors in their environment draw their attention to it. They tend to be smell and taste sensitive, and they tend to be auditorially sensitive. So all of our sensory systems go to DEFCON 1 because our brain perceives the planet as one giant threat. And so when I see kids that are getting diagnosed with quote-unquote attention problems, what we're really saying is that those are learning attention problems in the conventional way that we're teaching learning namely reading, writing, and math, and and the symbolic language of numbers and how they represent time and space and letters and how they're pictures of sounds. And I think that when you said earlier, Leslie, about how much easier it was for you to read music, it's a different symbolic language. And so clearly you understood that language differently than our alphabetic writing system. And so It's not uncommon, for example, when I have parents tell me, well, I don't understand how this could be a vision problem because they can sit down and play video games for like two days straight. And I say, that's not the same vision. It's completely different. And I'm sure this will come as a great shock to you and Tim, but when I have a response like that from somebody in the office, I'm probably going to send them 12 or 15 different articles to read or (laughs) five different links to go research Because I like, I've never been accused of people not getting enough information from me. (laughs) And I don't want them just to believe me. I want them to believe the body of literature that exists that no one's ever told them about. And so when I can back up what I say with all these literature references, it's a powerful statement to the body of information that they're being exposed to in a way that they didn't even know existed. Well, if I can improve on somebody's quality of life with a combination of lenses in the office that first time I visit them, I'm going to prescribe that right out of the gate because I want to know how much different am I going to make their quality of life. And the ultimate let's get to the root cause of what's happening here is eventually I'm probably going to have that patient come back and do other testing with me. And I think we'll try to put up in the show notes an article that I wrote some years ago 
called Why Can't I, E-Y-E, Why Can't I Learn? And the reason I wrote that article is because a now retired psychiatrist and I shared a number of kids that would get referred to her for any sort of mood regulating disorder, panic, depression, anxiety, ADHD, inattentive ADD. Well, we got to know each other so well that that she said, Doug, look, I understand that people need to come and see you. But when I tell them that you're an optometrist, they say, well, I've got an optometrist. She said, I need something more than that. So she was the catalyst for me to write this Why Can't I Learn article. And it's proven to be really, really powerful. And we'll make it available as a link on our show notes. But vision therapy is really getting to the root cause of why so many people struggle in the way that we're talking about. And and people say, well, what is vision therapy? You're going to make my eye muscles stronger? And I say, no, I'm going to change the way your brain tells your eye muscles what to do. And, And anybody that's played any sports understands the concept of muscle memory. And any learning that we do typically involves three different stages. What skill do you want me to demonstrate? And if I can't do it, teach me what I need to do. And I'll do it even though I have to spend a tremendous amount of conscious effort to accomplish the task you've set before me. And then I will keep doing it until it gets to the point where it's automatic, right? There's an expression that goes like this, neurons that fire together, wire together. So even though these skills may take a tremendous amount of effort and one may struggle with them at the beginning of things, when we fire those neural networks that control how our eyes point and focus together as an integrated synchronized team, that becomes increasingly effortless because I want somebody's brain available to process their environment and act upon that information. What I don't want them to do is spend a tremendous amount of their cognitive attentional resources on trying to figure out where to point their eyes, when to point them, and how long to point them for. That should be effortless. And so there's so many people in the population that have problems with what we're talking about, and they just don't know it because they've never had this kind of an exam before. So it turns out after sitting with you, well, the interesting thing that I think you did to me uh, is that the first examination, you didn't even tell me what you thought I had. And, and, uh, you know, and, and I think even told me, don't go plunking around on the web until I see you tomorrow. And the next day I come in and then there's this gargantuan briefcase full of colored lenses that I'm looking at. And I mean, it ended up being, I think, in totality, a three hour appointment over the course of two days. And it was pretty darn amazing because I walk out of there and you're like, I need to change your glasses. Uh, We're going to introduce some color therapy frames to you. And then I need to see if this is right. And once we find out it's right, then I think you need to seriously think about vision therapy. But I do think a lot of your learning struggles that you had while you were in school weren't related to the fact that you have been diagnosed as mildly dyslexic. That might be part of it, but I really do think it's the fact that your eyes aren't working together. So you put prisms. I have prisms in my glasses and I have tints and I wear these clear ones for when I'm presenting because I don't want to have a tint lens if I'm presenting or, or meetings or whatnot. So I have two pairs of glasses, but the minute I put those, those tints on, it just, I think I told you, it felt like it feels like a gargantuan chill pill. And it feels like I'm sticking a a little baby high definition TV on my face because it's just letting my eyes chill. Because like when you were talking about uh, the fact that, for example, things are, 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 are elevated for me, like noise, I'm very noise adverse. I'm so many other things because, and like you said, it's everything, my entire body is seems to be at an elevated level because of what I'm dealing with, with my eyes. So, so, uh, Correct me if I'm wrong. The biggie for me is binocular vision dysfunction. Am I correct with that? Well, yes. Binocular vision dysfunction, meaning your two eyes don't work well together as a synchronized team, and a magnocellular vision problem. And there's previous episodes, I believe, in early in season three or late in season two that specifically speak to the magnocellular visual system. And that's one of the therapies that, that we're still talking about, but you haven't started that one yet. No. But, but what we started with, though, was, was a new prescription with prism and color in the lenses. And I wanted you to experience that pair of glasses for two or three or four weeks because I wanted to know 
what your vision, brain, and body's response was to that new pair of glasses. And in many cases, that that those changes are so profound that the patients are happy, and that's all I do. But if they want more, then I've left the door open for them to come back and have a discussion with me about vision therapy and how we're going to change the brain's ability to tell the eyes what to do and how to do it. And, and I would like you, if you don't mind, can you, can you speak a little bit more about what your eyes, brain, and even body, postural-wise or otherwise, felt with the, with the new glasses, with the 10 and the prism? And, and this is the crazy thing. Like I go back and I look at videos of me pre-April and my face even looks different. I mean, you could just tell there's more, there was more strain in everything that I was doing. And, and like I said, that for me was one of the big boom goes the dynamite where all of a sudden, you know, I, I, my best friend from high school, I saw her in July. She's like, you even look different. Your face looks different. And it's simply because I'm not as strained as I used to be. Now I'm still strained. I mean, like once I did some research on on some of the things that come with the situations I have, like I, my mom, it was adorable. She's like, oh my gosh, I used to give you such a hard time when you would struggle to park a car or back a car out of a busy a parking lot. I will never do that to you again. And it's so funny to, to realize a lot of the things that I, I couldn't figure out why I struggled with um, are a lot of related to me having this vision disorder. And I, things got a lot better. Like, like I said, it's just like a giant chill pill and my body feels more relaxed, but I can still see where I'm struggling. And that was um, a, a, a great reason for why to move into vision therapy. But, but I agree with you. The moment I started wearing these glasses, my, my brain and my body just are a lot more comfortable with, with day to day. What I love about being able to practice this way, especially with the kind of glasses I prescribe, is that it can reduce sound sensitivity. It it can reduce tightness in somebody's jaw. It tends to have posture and balance outcomes. They tend to lose their touch sensitivity, and they tend to lose a lot of the tension and stress that they carry in their neck and shoulders. So the the glasses have the ability to change something called postural deficiency syndrome, which is a different discussion. And and we've done episodes about that uh, prior to this episode. But I I love being able to see the kind of changes that lenses make for patients. And And I'm glad that you had a positive response to the lenses. But like you said, it wasn't enough. You wanted more. And, and so currently you're using a software program that's designed to really automate and facilitate your brain's ability to learn how to use your two eyes together as a faster, more accurate, less effortful, easily sustainable synchronized team. And we're going to dovetail that program with a magnocellular program that is going to teach your brain how to see faster. And that's going to make the binocular vision piece even that much better. And if I can interrupt with with two quick things, I want to say this just in general. When you told me I needed glasses and they needed to have prisms and they needed to have colors, and then I realized I needed a pair that I just saw dollars flying out of my pocket. And I just want to give you kudos for your pricing because you really, I mean, I, I don't think I've paid as little as I've paid for glasses from you. And, and that was another time. That was another thing that made me realize, okay, this, this isn't him looking for the bucks. It's really him looking to try to help people. So I just want to say that. Um, and then another quick thing, and I don't know if you've done this in, in another podcast before, but uh, can you quickly, cause this for me was the aha. Can you quickly go over some of the things like if someone does have a binocular vision dysfunction or whatnot, what are the big telltales? Like, I, I mean, I, I know them in my head, but I, I don't want it to be just about me. What are some of the big things that, that someone might be struggling with that they would think, oh my gosh, maybe this is related to a vision problem. Yep. So from a kid's perspective, if they don't like to read or are behind in reading or get sleepy, tired, bored, lose attention, lose their place, skip over words or lines, reads slowly and laboriously, or can't easily remember what they read, there's almost always a vision component to that. And it's not enough to have the two-circle diagram exam 
because the, those two circles are not going to find what we're talking about. These kids could have difficulty with handwriting, difficulty lining up numbers on math problems. They could have difficulty copying from the board. They could have difficulty with uh, smaller ball sports, um, pickleball, racquetball, tennis, baseball, softball. Not as much problem with larger ball sports like soccer and basketball, but it doesn't mean that those sports still can't be affected. And then the older students and adults um, can't see as easily to drive at dusk or nighttime, have to grab the rails when they step on an escalator or wait a step or two or three to get their timing down, um, have bruises from hip to ankle from bumping into the corners of tables or the edges of door frames, a tendency to get motion sick when they're not driving in the car, or be an easily startled or jumpy front seat passenger in the car, or even when they're the driver and they're driving in the carpool lane, the K rails whiz past their peripheral vision. Those people will frequently tell me, no, let me rephrase that. They'll frequently admit to this happening when I pose the question, hey, when you're driving in the carpool lane and the K rails are whizzing past your peripheral vision, does it ever feel like your car is demonized and going to drive itself into the wall? <laughs> Because they've never offered that up to anybody because people would just think they're crazy. But when I pose the question in that manner, and we've got now a, a forum to be able to talk about why all this stuff is vision related, yes, they'll frequently say that that's exactly what happens. And it's why they don't drive in the carpool lane. And if it's extreme, they'll drive in the slowest lane because they can't handle the movement of traffic, both on the left and right side of them, it overwhelms them. You're describing me. And then the other one that I want to add um, is, like I mentioned before, uh, parking in tight spots, uh, parallel parking, backing up, um, all of those things. Even I, I mean, at one point I had one of the best technology cars out there and I still was super concerned about space. So <laughs> so you just you just described me, which is, and I'm, I'm sure others so thank <laughs> you for that. Yep. If you're wondering whether or not you need a third circle exam, let me give you an example of how common these problems are in the following areas. If you have a history of migraine, motion sickness, vertigo, a diagnosis of ADD, ADHD, a learning disability, dyslexia, uh, if you have dysgraphia, dyscalculia, if you've been diagnosed with a learning disability, chronic headaches, posture issues, uh, if you're prone to clumsiness, or your child's been diagnosed with clumsy child syndrome, or autism, or bipolar, or schizophrenia, odds are that you've got a vision component of any of those diagnoses. So if that sounds like you or someone you know, you need to find a doctor that does third circle testing. Okay. And I, I don't know if I'm going to use that kind of as a, a button at the end or maybe yep. at the very beginning to kind of get people's antenna up. I'll play with that. Um, okay. And now we just need to wrap up. Uh, uh, ask, uh, thank Leslie for being on the show and then ask you, ask you, Leslie, for your contact information, which, of course, we'll include in all the show notes and everything else. So, so now just kind of put a button on it, Doug, if you would. All right. Leslie, thank you for your time today and coming in being a guest on the Move, Look, and Listen podcast. It's been wonderful to share this time with you and, and for others to hear your story because it's important. And, and with some closing notes, tell us how we can find you and how to share what you do. Oh, well, first of all, thank you because you've definitely been a life upgrade. Uh, I mean, you've absolutely been a, a life upgrade and, and made my world a better place. So thank you and thank you for being you. Uh, my name is Leslie Fisher. My website is the exact same thing. Leslie, L-E-S-L-I-E, Fisher, F-I-S-H-E-R dot com. Uh, I, for a living, I keynote and feature speak at education technology conferences. So I'm all about sharing what I think is uh, engaging technology for educators. But I'm also a tinkerer and a gadget head. So feel free to find me on social media. I'm at Leslie Fisher on Twitter. I'm at Leslie Fisher's page on Facebook. Uh, feel free to find me. Uh, my direct message is open on Twitter, so feel free to send a hello or a question if you think that, that what I'm going through uh, visually uh, 
I might be able to give you some content to, to help you guys out. But uh, Dr. Doug, thank you for being able to expand a little bit more also on the situation for those people that might have uh, seen me present and I've sent them here to, to get some more content. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Move, Look and Listen podcast with Dr. Doug Steffi. All of the resources mentioned in this podcast and links to learn more about our guest can be found in the episode notes from whichever podcast app you might be listening with. You'll also find a link to Dr. Steffi's website, which is steffioptometry.com. That's S-T-E-P-H-E-Y optometry.com. You can also call the office at 626-332-4510. We'd like to take a quick moment to thank our sponsor, Audible. If you love podcasts, you'll love listening to audiobooks with Audible. Many of the books mentioned here in the podcast can also be found at Audible. Dr. Steffi has a free audiobook waiting for you as a gift just for listening to the Move, Look, and Listen podcast. Simply click the link in the show notes to audibletrial.com forward slash inbound. Sign up for a free 30-day membership trial and you can download any audiobook you like. And if for any reason and at any time you choose to cancel your membership, you get to keep all of your audiobook downloads. It's risk-free and for free for 30 days. Support the Move, Look, and Listen podcast by visiting audibletrial.com forward slash inbound. We really do appreciate you listening. And until next time, for Dr. Steffi of the Move, Look, and Listen podcast, I'm Tim Edwards with the Inbound Podcasting Network.